Good morning, friends. This is an abbreviated version of the sermon that I'm going to be preaching this morning uh, at Grace Church at the 9 o'clock outdoor service at the 11 o'clock indoor service. Um, you'll be able to watch uh, a live stream of that service or a recording of the live service at 11 o'clock or after 11 o'clock. But for those of you that are worshiping earlier, um, this is a, a Again, an abbreviated version with some meditations on the passage uh, for your benefit as you as you worship at home. Let's let's go ahead and pray together. Our Father in heaven, uh, we we pray that you would show us Jesus Christ. We pray that you would open our eyes to see Him in His glory. We pray that you would use your Word to open our eyes to see ourselves in the light of the truth and that you would do good work in us through the gospel. We thank you for your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, the passage <clears throat> that we're going to look at today is in Mark chapter 4, beginning with Mark, uh, Mark 4, verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd... They took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep in the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, on the first Sunday of last July, that's, that's almost a year ago exactly, we began to study the Gospel of Mark together. Uh, we've considered Mark's introduction to the person and the work of our Lord. We've seen Jesus call his first disciples and begin ministering to the crowds. We've witnessed his stunning power and his equally stunning compassion and his healing of the sick and his liberation of those possessed by demons. We've observed him in conflict with the religious leaders of the day, and we've heard him teach in parables about the true nature of the kingdom that he had come to establish. Well, we return this morning to the Gospel of Mark and to a passage that is both familiar and mysterious. In Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35, we read an account of the Lord Jesus calming a storm. Now, as I said, this is a familiar passage to, to us. The events recorded here are vivid and they are arresting to the imagination. But it's also mysterious. Uh, there are questions to be answered here. There are some knots that need to be untied, both in the details. I mean, how, how did he fall asleep in the middle of a storm like that? And in the meaning of this passage to us as disciples today. The Holy Spirit has recorded these events in the scriptures for a reason. They're, they're not just there to intrigue us or entertain us. There is a lesson here. There's a truth to be learned and believed and applied. After all, this is... God's holy scripture, and it is, as all scripture, breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that. And so, I want us to take a few minutes this morning uh, to consider this passage from that perspective. Uh, a, a true account of real events that is recorded for our instruction. Now, I have a three-point outline. We're going to consider, first, the teacher, Jesus Christ himself, and his identity as God and man. Second, we're going to consider the classroom, the circumstances in which Jesus teaches, specifically this storm that almost drowns his disciples, and what this specific choice of classroom tells us about the methods of this particular teacher. And then three, We'll consider the lesson itself. What is this really about? What is the point here? So first, the teacher. As I said last week, our faith, biblical Christianity, is, in the end, it's always personal. It's not about knowing something or living a certain way. It is about knowing someone. 
And so, when we consider the lesson of this passage, it's appropriate to begin there with the one who is doing the teaching. This passage gives us a clear and compelling picture of our Lord Jesus and his identity as both God and man. On the one hand, we see a display of power and authority that is profound, that is divine, calming the storm with a word. Now, if you look at the text carefully, it's very evident that Mark is communicating to us that the storm was bad. Bad storms were common in this region on the Sea of Galilee, but it sounds like this was an especially bad one. We have several reasons to think that. First, uh, Mark refers to it as a great storm. And remember, uh, the probable source in human terms of Mark's account here is the Apostle Peter, who was both a seasoned fisherman, a veteran on the Sea of Galilee, uh, and an eyewitness uh, to these events. He was in one of those boats. He was in the boat with the Lord Jesus. So when Mark says the storm was great, a great windstorm arose, those are probably Peter's words. This was probably a significant storm. Now that's evidenced by the fact that uh, the waves were breaking into the boat and the boats were already filling. As common as storms were in the region, storms that sunk everybody's ships couldn't have been a daily occurrence or they wouldn't have been able to continue as fishermen. This was a major storm. And also it was evidence, that's evidenced by their reaction. Uh, they wake Jesus up and they say, don't you care that we are perishing? The seasoned sailors, like the Apostle Peter that are in this boat, they think this is maybe it for them. Now, in the midst of this severe storm, the Lord Jesus is awakened. And upon awakening, he speaks. And when he speaks... When he says to the wind and the sea, peace, be still, the wind ceases and the water is calm. It does not say that the storm took a turn at that point or it began to die down suddenly. It says that it ceased and there was a great calm, Mark says, as great as the storm so the calm that followed. Now, I thought about ways to illustrate this. What would this be like? But um, frankly, none of us have ever seen anything like this. Uh, no, I, I never have, and I don't think any of you have either. A storm that was stopped just like that. It must have been jarring to them. I can only imagine what it would have been like to be in that boat that day. And all... All of this because of a word that Jesus speaks. Peace be still. The wind and the waves, as some commentators have noted, recognize the voice of their maker, and they stop immediately, because this is God in that boat. He has a power to command his friends and his enemies. He has power to command sickness and demons. He has power over blind eyes, over crippled limbs. He has power over death itself and even the wind and the rain. You can imagine what it would be like, friends, to be standing or sitting in the presence of someone, out on the open water in a boat or not, who speaks to a storm and it is suddenly still. Somebody with that power. Surely, if the Lord Jesus can command the wind and the waves, he can command a virus. He can command our government. He can command everything in his creation. He is God. Now, <clears throat> on the other hand, not only is he God, but he's also a real man. And we see this evidenced in the passage also because we find him asleep on the cushion in the stern. It seems like an odd thing. Hard to imagine somebody asleep in a storm like that. But I think it becomes much more understandable when we pause for a moment to consider the circumstances leading up to this point. It's taken us a year to walk through the first few chapters of the Gospel of Mark. It's taken us months to go through these, the day leading up to the Lord Jesus falling asleep in this boat. Uh, but it was an intense day. There were healings, there was controversy, there was teaching, 
There were crowds, huge crowds, overwhelming crowds, so much so that he had to have a boat there in case the crowds began to crush. And eventually used that boat to flee from those crowds and go across the sea. Uh, this is the Lord Jesus ministering at the, at the height of his attention here around the Sea of Galilee, spending sleepless nights in prayer and caring for people uh, long into, uh, into his exhaustion. You know, uh, since I, since Gretchen and I have had uh, children, and now we have we have six children, uh, I can sleep through things now that I would have thought impossible ten years ago. Uh, and usually, especially on Sundays in the afternoon, maybe after after I get up early and prepare and pray, after I uh, worship with you all now for for two services, one outside, one inside. I work half a day uh, doing ministry that's nowhere near as taxing as the Lord Jesus. And by the time I get home, I'm ready to fall asleep. And sometimes I have fallen asleep in uh, what you might think of as, what I think of as unusual circumstances. I have fallen asleep reading aloud before. <laughs> and I have uh, been been awakened only after someone jumped on me several times or <laughs> slapped me. Jubilee has been, uh, recently she's been opening my eyes when I fall asleep on the couch and pulling on my lips. And, and sometimes it takes a little while even for her to wake me up. I bring all that up to say that the fact that the Lord Jesus slept through the beginning part of this storm uh, is evidence, I think, it, it's a reminder to us that we're dealing with a real human man. The one who was doing all of this work, the one who was doing these miracles, he was a man of weakness and limits, just like we are. And he was exhausted, so much so that he slept through a storm. Now, in the text, both of these are clear. This is God we're dealing with. He speaks and the storm stops. This is a man we're dealing with. He's so exhausted, he's asleep. You put those two together. He is God and he is man. And you have the doctrine of the incarnation. The truth taught in the scriptures that God himself willingly came down and became one of us. And friends, remember why he did that. Anytime we think about the incarnation and Christ's humanity and his deity, it's worth remembering what the purpose was behind that. He came in the flesh so that the living God could die for sinners. We had sinned and rebelled against him. We had earned condemnation for ourselves. We were unable to rescue ourselves. And so he, in mercy, compassion, and pity, he looks on us with love. An almighty, immortal God takes on weak and fragile human flesh so that he could suffer and die in our place, so that he could pay our penalty at the cross, so that we could live. That's who's in the boat. That's who's teaching the lesson. God and man. Now, <clears throat> second, uh, I want to sh say a few words about the classroom that they were in. A teacher like this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, does nothing haphazardly or by accident. And the circumstances that unfold in this account are no different. They leave the shore by his bidding and they come into this storm, ultimately, also by his bidding. The scriptures are clear. It is God who sends the rain. And here is God in the boat, in the midst of this particular storm. Now you can imagine what it was like for them that day. You can imagine them um, sailing across the Sea of Galilee in these you know, boats that are maybe 30 feet long. The wind starts to pick up a little bit. Uh, there's some ominous darkening of the clouds. The, the friendly conversation among the disciples in the boats dies down as they realize what's looming over them. The rains start to fall and then fall harder. The wind blows. The waves begin to grow and the situation becomes dire. You can imagine fishermen like Peter or John exchanging looks, knowing looks with each other uh, as they're working to keep the ships afloat. This is bad. This is really bad, the situation that they're in. And though they did not realize it, 
all of it is in the sovereign care of their master, who is there in the boat with them, asleep in the stern. As amazing as that is. There's something to, for us to observe here, though, as well. Our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, he does allow his servants to suffer sometimes. He does allow us to be faced with situations that sometimes look bad, look really bad. His lessons are not always taught on sunny days with clear skies or on stable ground. In fact, oftentimes uh, they're not taught in comfortable circumstances like that. That's not to say the Lord Jesus is harsh or callous, though. Clearly, he has a tender heart towards his disciples and towards us. I mean, you can't miss the accusatory tone uh, in the, the disciples when they wake him up. Don't you care? Uh, well, he does care, and he corrects them. But even that correction that he gives them, it's given in such a gentle and compassionate way. Um, as I said, I... I've been woken up sometimes <laughs> at, at our house and sometimes rudely, sometimes when I'm exhausted. And when I am woken up uh, from a deep sleep, when I am very tired, uh, I am in a foul mood immediately. Uh, I do not like being <laughs> woken up like that. And uh, I am unfortunately very ready in the flesh to inflict pain on those who have caused me such discomfort. I'm sure some of you can identify. But you see none of that here in the Lord Jesus. You see no malice in him, even as he corrects them. Uh, the storm, the circumstances that are so dire, they've come from him, but not from a cold heart, and from a hard hand. And yet, there is a storm, a storm so severe that seasoned fishermen believe that they are maybe perishing there. Uh, this is an awful storm. And it has come from God's own hand. When our Lord intends for a lesson to be taught, it gets taught. He ensures that it does. And he uses the means that are necessary to teach it, even if those means are a darkened sky and howling winds and mighty waves that start to break into our little boats. Sometimes that's what the classroom he chooses looks like. That's what lessons look like when you have God for your teacher. Now, has that been true in your life? It has absolutely been true in mine. Now, there are times that I didn't recognize that I was in class until later on, but boy, boy was I. Those, those seasons of dark skies and howling winds, the seasons of, of heaviness under the hand of God, Friends, as I look back, those seasons are the seasons where God has taught me and matured me. My wife, too, and so many folks that I know, brothers and sisters in Christ. I've quoted it to you many times, but I don't miss the opportunity to do so when I can. Samuel Rutherford said, Oh, what I owe to the, the hammer and the file and the furnace of my Lord. Uh, I'm sure you can understand that if you've walked with Christ very long. Uh, it's Again, Rutherford said, grace grows best in winter. It is these dark times, cold times, that God sometimes uses, often uses, to do the most work in us. Now, this is an important lesson for us to learn, what his classroom looks like. Uh, that, that his disciples, though beloved to him, we are not exempt from trial. In fact, Suffering and difficulty is oftentimes the very means of his grace. It is the classroom he brings his beloved children into when he intends that we learn a lesson from him. Friends, if we will remember that, it will help us make sense of this life with him. It will help us to recognize when we're in the classroom. And rather than bristle or grumble against him, it will help us to trust him and in trusting him to willingly humble ourselves before him and take the posture of a student ready to learn. And that brings us to the third and the final point that I want to make, uh, the actual lesson that he teaches them. This passage teaches us not just about who the Lord Jesus is or how he works, but in the end it teaches us something very important about what it means to really trust in him. 
The primary lesson here is about faith, what true faith really is. Our Lord Jesus brought his disciples out there in that storm. The teacher led his pupils into that terrifying classroom to show them that they were not yet really trusting in him, not as they should, and in that way to call them to put their trust in him. You think about it. The apostles, they were with their master. They were ministering by his side. They were doing his work, but they find themselves in in trouble here. When the storm rises, they panic, and they wake him. They wake him to rebuke him, not to plead for his help. Um, he rises, and he, he rebukes them, but, but not for waking him. He rebukes them for their fear, which he very clearly connects to their unbelief. Look at verse 40. <clears throat> he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Though they were his disciples, he identifies a vital element of their response to him that is missing in them. They weren't trusting in him. As we've seen already in Mark's gospel, these disciples, I mean, they have responded to him and to his message. They've heard his call and they've answered. They left all to follow him. They heard his teaching and they accepted it. They aligned themselves with him in controversy, but something was still lacking here. They did not yet really trust him, not as they should. Their knowledge of him had not ripened into real trust in him, not yet. And so when the trial came, when the storm blew in and the the rubber of discipleship met the road of suffering, their faith was deficient. They knew the doctrine. They'd lived the life to some extent, but they did not trust in the Lord. And real practical trust in God is a vital part of true faith in him. Now, this is a lesson that we learn all over the Bible. You think about Israel in the wilderness, after the Exodus, when they've been brought through, after the plagues, after the Passover, through the the Red Sea parted, and they're in the wilderness. And they they still don't trust that God is going to provide for them the water and the food that they need. Now, when they're they're called to enter into the promised land, when he sustained them with manna day after day, and yet they're afraid to go in, they're afraid to obey him, because they don't trust him. They received his law. They saw his works. They aligned themselves with him. They even fought for his name, but, but they did not trust him to take care of them. When the storm came, They did not believe that he would carry them through. And that, friends, was a great sin. It grieved God's heart to be counted untrustworthy, as it does any parent to be counted untrustworthy by your own children. Now, in contrast to Israel's sin, think instead about Abraham. Think about Abraham when that God brought him into that storm of his command to take Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him. That was a trial. That was suffering. You think of that night that Abraham was wrestling with God's command to do this awful thing. Abraham heard what God said. He obeyed in faith. And he trusted, the author of Hebrews tells us, that the Lord was going to raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham believed that God was going to carry him through, and he trusted him. That's why Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul calls Abraham the father of all who believe. Here is faith. Here is trust. To look at the storm and say, this looks bad. This looks really bad. But I know he will carry us through. I know that he is trustworthy. I trust him. That's what faith looks like. Friends, Israel, in the wilderness, they should have said, yes, Lord, despite the danger. When they looked around and they saw that there there wasn't water anywhere and the the people were thirsty. When they looked and they saw uh, the size of the people in Canaan and the, the military improbability of being able to conquer them. They should have looked at it and said, this looks bad. It looks really bad. 
But I know that our God will carry us through. He is trustworthy. I trust him. That's what faith looks like. The disciples in the boat, they should have woken Jesus up. Yes, they should have asked him for help, but they should have done it trusting him, not panicking in terror. They should have looked at the storm and said, look, this looks bad. This looks really bad. But I know that he will carry us through. I know he is trustworthy. Friends, things are no different with us. We must trust him, really trust him. And the trials that we face, the storms he sends us into, they are there in part to show us where our faith is deficient and call us to put our trust in him. Are we really trusting him? I don't just mean agreeing with his teaching. I don't just mean living according to his instruction. But I mean trusting him to carry us through. These recent trials that we've gone through as a church, not being able to meet together, that we've gone through as a nation, that we continue to go through, what have they exposed about us, about our trust in our Savior? As things have gotten out of our control, what have we seen in ourselves? Now, maybe we haven't rejected the doctrines. We haven't forsaken the life. But have we panicked like the disciples in the boat? Have we grumbled like Israel in the wilderness? Or have we been like Abraham on that fateful night, facing the storm that God has sent us, but in the end, reasoning that the God that we know as a friend would surely not intend evil for us? no matter how it looks at the moment. That though things look bad, really bad, we know that he will carry us through. He's trustworthy. If these trials have exposed weakness in your heart, friends, weakness in your faith, take heart. But the Lord Jesus did not deal with his disciples that day in the boat in that way in order to shame them or dismiss them. He did it to teach them, to strengthen them. And he did. It didn't happen in, in an instant, but it happened. Their faith was strengthened. The lesson he wanted to teach them, they did learn. He is that sort of teacher. The apostle Peter, the same man who sat panicked in that boat that day, later on he wrote to the churches counseling them in First Peter, do not be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you as if something strange were happening. He told them, as we've studied in detail recently, that they are to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. Peter learned that God could be trusted, that though things look bad, really bad, we know that he will carry us through. He is trustworthy. And friends, we need to learn that lesson too. Uh, we are in a storm now. Maybe it's almost over. Maybe it's going to get worse. I don't know. But there will be other storms. But as there are other storms that our Lord sends us into, so our Lord will be with us in them. Jesus Christ will not abandon Grace Church. He's not going to abandon me. He's not going to abandon you. Our God has humbled himself to come into this little boat to be with us. And he is sovereign over the storms, all of them. And he has sent us into those storms for a reason. And the reason is not to let us drown. It is for our good and for his glory. Will we trust in him? That's the question. He has never failed us. Year after year, generation after generation. The one who can speak to the wind and the waves, who can speak to the nations, who can speak to a virus and make peace just like that. He's never failed us. Now, the, the apostles had ample reason to trust him even thus far. And they didn't know yet about the cross. They didn't know what was coming. How far he was willing to go to prove that he is trustworthy. But we know. We've, we've seen the extent he was willing to go to love his own to the end. He's worthy of our trust. Friends, trust him. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Thank you for sending the Lord Jesus to us, that we might know you. And thank you, Jesus, for enduring these trials so that we might know who you are. Oh, help us to trust in you. 
Help us, Lord, to, not just to agree with doctrine, not just to, to live a certain lifestyle, uh, but to actually trust you, to trust you with our children, to trust you with our money, to trust you with our health, to trust you with our church, to trust you with our nation, to trust you with our rights and our freedom, all of it. You are trustworthy. Thank you for your word that teaches us. We pray this Christ in your name. Amen.